Scene one, a hall in Duke Salinas's palace. Enter Duke Salinas, Aegean, jailer, officers, and other attendants. Proceed, Salinas, to procure my fault, and by the doom of death and woes and all. Merchant of Syracuse, please no more. I am partial to infringe our laws. The enmity and discord which of late sprung from the rancorous outrage of your duke to merchants. Our well-dealing countrymen who, wanting guilders to redeem their lives, have sealed his rigorous statutes with their bloods, excludes all pity from our threatening looks. For since the mortal and intestine jars twixt thy seditious countrymen and us, it hath in solemn synods been decreed by both the Syracusians and ourselves to admit no traffic to our adverse towns, nay, more, if any born at Ephesus be seen at any Syracusian marts and fairs, Again, if any Syracusian born come to the bay of Ephesus, he dies. His goods confiscate to the Duke's dispose, unless a thousand marks be levied to quit the penalty and to ransom him. Thy substance valued at the highest rate cannot amount unto a hundred marks. Therefore, by law, thou art condemned to die. Yet this my comfort when your words are done, my woes and likewise with the evening sun. Well, Syracusian, say in brief the cause why thou departest from thy native home, and for what cause thou camest to Ephesus. A, a heavier task could not have been imposed than I to speak, a grief's unspeakable. Yet, that the world may witness that my end was wrought by nature, not by vile offense, I'll utter what my sorrows give me leave. In Syracuse I was born, and wed unto a woman happy but for me, and and by me had not her hap been bad, with her I, I lived in joy. Our wealth increased by prosperous villages, voyages I, I often made to Epidamnum. Till my factor's death and the great care of goods at random left drew me from kind embracements of my spouse, from whom my absence was not six months old before herself, almost at fainting under the pleasing punishment that, that women bear, had made provision for her following me and soon and safe arrived where I was. There had she not been long, but she became a joyful mother of, of two goodly sons. And, which was strange, the one so like the other as, as could not be distinguished but by names. That very hour, and in the selfsame inn, a, a meaner woman was delivered of such a burden, male twins, both alike. And those, for their parents were exceeding poor, I, I bought and brought up to attend my sons. My wife not meanly proud of two such boys, made daily motions for her home return, and unwilling, I agreed. Alas, too soon, we came aboard. A league from Epidamnum had we sailed before the always window bay deep gave any tragic instance of our harm. But longer did we not retain much hope, for what obscured light the heavens did grant did but convey unto our fearful minds a doubtful warrant of immediate death which, though myself would gladly have embraced, yet the incessant weepings of my wife, weeping before for what she saw must come, and piteous plainings of the, of the pretty babes that born for fashion, ignorant what to fear, forced me to seek delays for them and me, and, and this it was, for other means was none. The sailors sought for safety by our boat and left the ship then sinking right to us. My wife, more careful, careful for the latter born, had fastened him onto a small spare mast, such as such a seafaring men provide for storms. To him, one of the other twins was bound, whilst I had been like heedful of the other, the children thus disposed, my wife and I, fixing our eyes on whom our care was fixed, fastened ourselves at either end the mast, and, and floating straight, obedient to the stream, was carried towards Corinth, as we thought. At length, the sun, gazing upon the earth, dispersed those vapors that offended us, and, and by the benefit of his wished light, the seas waxed calm, and we discovered two ships from far making a main to us, of Corinth that, and Epidaurus this, but ere they came, uh, let me say no more, but got the sequel by what went, that by that went before. Nay, forward, old man, do not break off so, for we may pity, though not pardon thee. <laughs> oh, had the gods done so. I had not now worthily termed them merciless to us, for ere the ships, ships could meet by twice five leagues, we were encountered by a mighty rock, 
which being violently borne upon, her helpful ship was split in the midst so that in this unjust divorce of us, fortune had left both of us alike what to delight in and what to sorrow for. Her, her part, poor soul, uh, seeming as burdened with lesser weight, but not with lesser woe, was carried with more speed before the wind. And in her sight, they three were taken up by a fishman of Corinth, Corinth or as we thought, at, at length, another ship had seized on us. And knowing whom it was their hap to save, gave helpful wel welcome to their shipwrecked guests and would have reft the fishers of their prey had not their bark been very slow of sail. And therefore homeward did they bend their course. Thus have you heard me severed from my bliss that by misfortunes was my life prolonged to tell sad stories of my own mishaps. And for the sake of them thou sorrowest for, do me the favor to dilate at full what hath befallen of them and thee till now. My youngest boy and, and my eldest care at 18 years became inquisitive after his brother and importuned me that his attendant, so his case was like you know, reft of his brother but retained his name, might bear him company in the quest of him, whom whilst, whilst I labored of a love to see, I, I hazarded the loss of whom I loved. Five summers have I spent in furthest Greece, roaming clean through the bounds of Asia, and coasting homeward came to Ephesus, hopeless to find, yet, yet loath to leave on sought or that or any place that harbors men. But here must end the story of my life, and, and happy were I in my timely death, could, could all my travels warn me they live. Hapless Aegean, whom the fates have marked to bear the extremity of dire mishap, now trust me, were it not against our laws, against my crown, uh, my oath, my, my dignity, which princes would they may not disannul, my soul would sue as advocate for thee. But though thou art adjudged to the death and past sentence, may not be recalled, but to our honor's great disparagement, yet I will favor thee in what I can. Therefore, merchant, I'll limit thee this day to seek thy life by beneficial help. Try all the friends thou hast in Ephesus. Beg thou or borrow to make up this sum and live. If no, then thou art doomed to die. Jailer, take him to thy custody. I will, my lord. Hopeless and helpless doth the Gian wend, but to procrastinate his lifeless end. Scene two, the market. Enter Antiphilus of Syracuse, Dromeo of Syracuse, and first merchant. Therefore, give you out of Epidunum, lest that your goods too soon be confiscated. This very day, a Syracusian merchant is apprehended for a rival here. And not being able to buy out his life according to the statue of the town, dies, and the weary sun is set in the west. Oh, <laughs> there is your money that I had to keep. Go, so, bear it to the centaur where we host, and stay there, Dromeo, till I come to thee. Within this hour, it will be dinner time. Till that, I'll view the manners of the town, peruse the traders, gaze upon the buildings, and then return and sleep within mine inn. For with long travel, I am stiff and weary. Get thee away. Many a man would take you at your word and go indeed, having so good in a mean. <laughs> a trusty villain, sir, that very off when I am dull with care and melancholy, lightens my humor with his merry jests. What, will you walk with me about the town and then go to my inn to dine with me? I am invited, sir, to certain merchants of whom I hope to make much benefit. I crave your pardon. Soon at five o'clock, please you, I'll meet with you upon the mart, and afterward consort you till bedtime. <clears throat> My present business calls me from you now. No, farewell till then. I will go lose myself and wander up and down to view the city. 
So I commend you to your own content. He commends me to mine own content, commends me to the thing I cannot get. I to the world am like a drop of water that in the ocean seeks another drop, who falling there to find his own fo fellow forth, unseen, inquisitive, confounds himself. So I to find a mother and a brother in quest of them, unhappy, lose myself. Oh, here comes the almanac of my true date. What now? How chance thou art returned so soon? Return so soon? Rather approach too late. The capon burns, the pig falls from the spit. The clock hath struck in twelve upon the bell. My mistress made it one upon my cheek. She is so hot because the meat is cold. The meat is cold because you come not home. You come not home because you have no stomach. You have no stomach having broke your fast. But we that know what is to fast and to pray are penitent for your default today. Stop in your wind, sir. Tell me this, I pray. Where have you left the money that I gave you? Oh, a sixpence that I had a Wednesday last to pay the saddler for my mistress's crupper? The saddler had it, sir. I kept it not. I am not in a sportive humor now. Tell me, and dally not, where is the money? <laughs> we being strangers here, how darest thou trust so great a charge from thine own custody? I pray you, ere as you sit as as you sit at dinner, I from my mistress come to you in post. If I return, I shall be post indeed, for she will score your fault upon my pate. Methinks your ma, like mine, should be your clock and strike you home without a messenger. Come, Dromeo, come! These chests are out of reason. Reserve them till a merrier hour than this. Where is the gold I gave in charge? To thee. To me, sir? Why, you gave no gold to me. Come on, sir knave. Have done your foolishness, and tell me how thou hast disposed thy charge. My charge was but to fetch you from the mart home to your house, the phoenix, sir, to dinner. My mistress and her sister stays for you. In what safe place you have bestowed my money? Or I shall break that merry sconce of yours that stands on tricks when I am undisposed. Where is the thousand marks thou hast of me? I have some marks of yours upon my pate, some of my mistress's marks upon my shoulders, but not a thousand marks between you both. If I should pay your worship those again for chance, you will not bear them so patiently. The mistress's marks? What mistress, sir, hast thou? Your worship's wife, my mistress of the phoenix. She that does fast until you come home to dinner and prays that you will hie you home to dinner. What? Would thou flout me thus unto my face, being forbid? There! Take you that, sir knave! What mean you, sir? For God's sake, hold your hands. Nay, and you will not, sir. I'll take my heels. Upon my life, by some device or other, the villain is overwrought of all my money. They say this town is full of cousinage, as nimble jugglers that deceive the eye, dark-working sorcerers that change the mind, soul-killing witches that deform the body, disguised cheaters, prating mountebanks, and many like such like liberties of sin, if it prove so. I will be gone the sooner. I'll go to the centaur to seek this knave. I'll great, I greatly fear my money is not safe. Act two, scene one. The house of Antiphilus in Ephesus. Enter Adriana and Luciana. Neither my husband nor my servant returned, that in such haste I sent to seek his master. Sure, Luciana, it is two o'clock. Perhaps some merchant hath invited him, and from the Marty somewhere gone to dinner. Good sister, let us dine and never fret. A man is master of his liberty. Time is their master, and when they see time, they'll go or come. 
If so, be patient, sister. Why should their liberty then ours be more? Because their business still lies out a door. Look, when I serve him so, he takes it ill. Oh, no, he is the bridle of your will. There's number asses will be bridled so. Bridled so. <laughs> Why, headstrong liberty is lashed with woe. There's nothing situate under heaven's eye, but hath his bound in earth, in sea and sky. The beasts, the fishes, and the winged fowls, and their male subjects, and at their controls. Men more divine, the masters of all these, lords of the wide world and wide watery seas, endued with intellectual sense and souls of more preeminence than fish and fowls, are masters to their females and their lords, then let your will attend on their accords. This servitude makes you to keep unwed. No, <laughs> but troubles of the marriage bed. But were you wedded, you would bear some sway. Ere I learn love, I'll practice to obey. How, if your husband stops some other way? Till he come home again, I would forbear. Patience unmoved, no marvel, though she pause. They can be meek that have no other cause. A wretched soul bruised with adversity. We bid be quiet when we hear it cry. But were we burdened with it, with like weight of pain, as much or more would we ourselves complain. Mm, so thou that hast no unkind mate to grieve thee, with urging helpless patience wouldst relieve me. But if thou live to see that like right bereft, this fool begged patience in thee will be left. <laughs> well, I will marry one day but to try. Here comes your man, now is your husband nigh. Say, is your tardy master now at hand? Nay, he's at two hands with me. And two ears can witness. Say, didst thou speak with him? Knowst thou his mind? Aye, aye, he told his mind upon my ear. Beshrew his hand, I scarce could understand it. Spake he so doubtfully that thou couldst not feel his meaning? Nay, he struck so plainly I could too well feel his blows, and with all so deathly that I could scarce understand them. But say, I pray thee, is he coming home? It seems he hath great care to please his wife. My mistress, sure, my master is born mad. Born mad? Thou villain! I mean not cuckold mad, but sure he is stark mad. When I desired him come home to dinner, he asked me for a thousand marks in gold. "'Tis dinner time, quoth I, my gold, quoth he. "'Your meat doth burn, quoth I, my gold, quoth he. "'Will you come home, quoth I, my gold, quoth he. "'Where is that thousand marks I gave thee, villain? "'The pig, quoth I, is burned, my gold, quoth he. "'My mistress, sir, quoth I, hang up thy mistress. "'I know not thy mistress, out on thy mistress. "'Quoth who? "'Quoth my master. "'I know, quoth he. "'No house, no wife, no mistress.' So that my errand do unto my tongue, I thank him I bear home upon my shoulders, for in conclusion he did beat me there. Hmm. Go back again, thou knave, and fetch him home. Go back again and be new beaten home? For God's sake, send some other messenger. Back, knave, or I will break thy pate across. And he will bless that cross with another beating. Between you I shall have a holy head. Hence, prating peasant, fetch my master home. Am I so round with you as you with me, that like a football you do spurn me thus? You spurn me hence, and he will spurn me hither. If I last in the servants, you must case me in leather. Fie! How impatience lureth in your faith! His company must do his minions grace, whilst I at home stop for a merry look, hath homely age the alluring beauty to look. Oh! <laughs> From my poor cheek, then he hath wasted it. On my discourses, do bury my wit. If voluble and sharp discourse be marred, unkindness blunts it more than marble hard. Do their gay vestments his affections bait? That's not my fault. He's master of my state. What ruins are in me that can be found by him not ruined? Then is he bound of my the features? My decayed fair, a sunny look of his would so, a sunny look of his would soon repair. But to one really dear, he breaks the pale and feeds from home. Poor I am, but his tail. 
self-harming jealousy. Fie, beat it hence. And feeling fools can with such wrongs dispense. I know his eye doth homage other where, or else what lets it but he would be here. Sister, you know he promised me a chain. Would that alone, alone he would detain, so he would keep fair quarter with his bed. I see the jewel best enameled will lose his beauty, yet the gold bad still, that others touch, and often touching will, wear gold, and no man that hath a name, by falsehood and corruption doth it shame. Since that my beauty cannot please his eye, oh, I'll weep what's left away and weep and die. How many fond fools serve mad jealousy? <laughs> Scene two, a public place. Enter Antiphilus of Syracuse. The gold I gave to Dromeo is laid up, safe at the centaur, and the heedful man is wandered forth in care to seek me out by, by computation and mine host's report. I could not speak with Dromeo since at first I sent him from the mart. See, here he comes. How now, sir? Is your very humor altered? As you love strokes, so jest with me again. You know no centaur. You received no gold. Your mistress sent me home, sent to have me home to dinner. My house was at the Phoenix. Wast thou mad that thou so madly thou didst answer me? What answer, sir? When spake I such a word? Even now, even here, not. Half an hour since! I did not see you since you sent me hence, home to the centaur with the gold you gave me. Villain, thou didst deny the gold's receipt and told me of a mistress and a dinner, for which I hope thou felt I was displeased. I am glad to see you in this merry vein. What means this jest? I pray you, master, tell me. Yeah. Dost thou jeer and flout me in the teeth? Thinks thou I just hold? Take thou pet and oh, pet. No! Hold, sir, for God's sake! Now your jest is earnest. Upon the bargain did you give it me? Because that I familiarly sometimes do use you for my fool and chat with you, your sauciness will jest upon my love and make a comment of my serious hours. When the sun shines, let foolish Nates make sport, but creep in crannies when he hides his beams. If you will jest with me, know my aspect, and fashion your demeanor to my looks, or I will beat this method in your sconce. Sconce, you call it? So you would leave battering? I had rather have it ahead. And knew to you these blows long, I must get a sconce for my head and end sconce it too, or else I shall, I shall seek my wit in my shoulders. But I pray, sir, why am I beaten? Dost thou not know? Nothing, sir, but that I am beaten. Shall I tell you why? Why, sir, and wherefore? For they say every why hath a wherefore. Why, first, for flouting me, and then, wherefore, for urging it the second time to me. Was there ever any man thus beaten out of season? Then in the why and the wherefore is neither rhyme nor reason. Well, sir, I thank you. Thank me, sir, for what? Mary, sir, for this something that you gave me for nothing. I'll make you amends next to give you nothing for something. But say, sir, is it dinner time? No, sir, I think the meat wants that I have. In good time, sir, what's that? Basting. Well, sir, then twill be dry. If it be, sir, I pray you eat none of it. Your reason? Lest it make you choleric and purchase me another dry basting. Well, sir, learn to jest in good time. There's a time for all things. I durst have denied that before you were so choleric. By what rule, sir? 
Mary, sir, by a rule as plain as the plain bold paint of Father Time himself. Let's hear it. There's no time for a man to recover his hair that grows bald by nature. May he not do it by fine and recovery? Yes, to pay a fine for a periwig and recover the lost hair of another man. Why is time such a miser of hair being as it is so plentiful an excrement? Because it is a blessing that he bestows on beasts, and what he hath scanted men in hair he hath given them in wit. Why, but there's many a man hath more hair than wit. Not a man of those, but he hath the wit to lose his hair. Why, thou didst conclude, hairy men, plain dealers without wit. The plain dealer, the sooner lost, yet he loseth it in a kind of dollity. For what reason? For two, and sound ones, too. Nay, not sound, I pray you. Sure ones, then. Nay, not sure in a thing falsing. Certain ones, then. Name them. The one to save the money that he spends in trimming, and the other, that at dinner they should not drop in his porridge. You would all this time have proved there is no time for all things. Marion did, sir, namely, no time to recover hair lost by nature. But your reason was not substantial. Why there is no re time to recover? Thus I mend it. Time himself is bald, and therefore to the world's end will have bald followers. I knew it would be a bald's conclusion, but soft. <laughs> Who lost us wonder? Yonder. Ah, ah, Antiphilus, look strange and frown. Some other mistress hath thy sweet aspects. I am not Adriana, nor thy wife. The time was once when thou on earth wouldst bow, that never words were music to thine ear, that never object pleasing in thine eye, that never touch well welcome to thy hand, that never meat sweet savoured in thy taste, unless I spake or looked or touched or carved to thee. How comes it now, my husband, oh, how comes it, that thou art thus estranged from thyself? Thyself I call it being strange to me. That undividable, incorporate, and better than thy dear self's better part. Ah, oh, do not tear away thyself from me. For no, my love, as easy mayest thou fall a drop of water in the breaking gulf, and take unmingled that same drop again, without addition or diminishing, as take from me thyself and not me too. How dearly would it touch me to the quick, shouldst thou but hear I were licentious, and that this body consecrate to thee by ruffian lust should be contaminant. Wouldst thou not spit at me and spurn at me and hurl the name of husband in my face and tear the stains again off my harlot brow and from my false hand cut the wedding ring and break it with a deep divorcing bow. I know thou canst, and therefore see thou do it. I am possessed with an adulterate blot. My blood is mingled with the crime of lust. For if we two be one and thou play false, I do digest the poison of thy flesh, being strumpeted by thy contagion. Keep them far league in truth with thy true bed. I live unstained, thou unhonored. Plead you to me, fair dame? I know you not. In Ephesus, I am but two hours old, as strange unto your town as to your talk, who every word by all my wit being scanned, want wit in all one word to understand. Why, brother, how the world is changed with you when were you wont to use your sister thus? She sent for you by Dromeo home to dinner. What by Dromeo? By me. By thee, and this thou didst return from him, that he did buffet thee, and in his blows denied my house for his, me for his wife. Did you converse, sir, with this gentlewoman? What is the course and drift of your compact? I, sir, I never saw her till this time. Villain? Thou liest, for even her very words didst thou deliver to me on the mart. 
I never spake with her in all my life. How can she thus then call us by our names unless it be by inspiration? How ill agrees it with your gravity to count a fist that's grossly with your man. <laughs> abetting him to thwart me in my mood. What? Be it my wrong you offer me exempt, but wrong not that wrong with a more contempt. Come, I will fasten on the sleeve of thine, thou art an ill my husband's eye of thine, whose weakness married to thy strongest state makes me with thy strength to communicate. If aught possess thee from me, it is dross, usurp an ivy, brow, or idle moss, who all for want of pruning with intrusion infect thyself and to live me. on thy confusion. To me, she speaks, she moves me for her theme. What? Was I married to her in my dream? Or sleep I now and think I hear all this? What error drives our eyes and ears amiss? Until I know for sure uncertainty, I'll entertain that offered fallacy. Romeo, go bid the servants spread for dinner. Oh, for my beads, I cross me for a sinner. This is the fairy land. Oh, spite of spites, we talk with goblins, owls, and sprites. If we obey them not, this will ensue. I'll suck our breath or pinch his back black and blue. Why pratest thou to thyself and answerest not? Dromeo, thou drone, thou snail, thou slug, thou sot. Transformed, master, am I not? I think thou art in mind, and so am I. Nay, master, both in mind and in my shape. Thou hast thine own form. No, I am an ape. If thou art changed to aught, tis to an ass. Tis true, she rides me, and I long for grass. Tis so, I am an ass. What else could it ever be? But I should, should know her as well as she knows me. I'm come, no longer will I be a fool to put the finger in the eye and weep, whilst man and master laugh my woes to scorn. Come, sir, to dinner. Draw me up, keep the gate. Husband? I'll dine above with you today, and shrive you of a thousand idle pranks. Sirrah, if any ask you for your master, say he dines forth, and let no creature enter. Come, sister, draw me. Play the portal well. Am I in heaven, in earth, or in hell? Sleeping or walking, mad or well advised? Known unto these and to myself disguise. I'll say as they say, and press over so, and in this mist, at all adventures, go. Master, shall I be porter at the gate? Ay, and let none enter, lest I break your pate. Come, come, um, Antipholus, we dine too late. Act three. Scene one, before the house of Antipholus of Ephesus. Enter Antipholus of Ephesus, Dromeo of Ephesus, Angelo, and Balthazar. Good to meet you must excuse all. Life is ruined, keep not ours. Say that I lingered with you at your shop to see the making of her Carcanet, and that tomorrow you will bring it home. <laughs> but here's a villain that would face me down. He met me at the mart, and then I beat him and charged him with a thousand marks in gold, and I did deny my wife and house. Thou drunkard, thou! What dost thou mean by this? Say what you will, sir, but I know what I know, that you beat me at the mart, and I have your hand to show. If skin were parchment and the blows you gave were ink, your own handwriting would tell you what I think. I think thou art an ass. Mary, so it doth appear by the wrongs I suffer and the blows I bear. I should kick being kicked. And it being at that pass, you would keep from my heels and beware of an ass. You're sad, Senor Balthazar. Pray, God our cheer may answer my good will and your good welcome here. Hold your dainties cheap, sir, and your welcome dear. Oh, Senor Balthazar, either had flesh or fish, a table of welcome makes scarce one dainty dish. 
Good meat, sir, is common at every churl for its... And welcome more common for nothing but words. Small cheer and great welcome makes a merry feast. I to a miserly host and a more sparing guest. But though my cates be mean, take them in good part. Better cheer, cheer may you have, but not with better heart. But soft. My door is locked. Go bid them let us in. Maud, Bridget, Marion, Sibley, Jillian, Jim, Mo, Mold Horse, Capen, Coxcomb, Idiot, Patch. Either get thee from the door or sit down at the hatch. Dost thou conjure for wenches that thou callst for such a store? When one is one too many, go get thee from the door. Oh, Patch has made our porter. My master stays in the street. Let him walk from whence he came, lest he catch on catch cold on his feet. Who talks within there? Oh, open the door. Right, sir. I'll tell you when, and you tell me wherefore. Wherefore? My dinner. I have not dined today. Nor today here you must not. Come again when you may. What art thou that keepest me from out of the house that I owe? The porter for this time, sir, and my name is Romeo. Oh, villain! Thou hast stolen both mine office and my name. The one ne'er got me credit, the other mickle blame. If thou hadst been Romeo today in my place, thou wouldst have changed thy face for a name or thy name for an ass. What a coil is there, Romeo? Who are those at the gate? Let my master in, loose. Faith, no, he comes too late. So tell your master. Oh, Lord, I must laugh. How about you with the proverb? Shall I set in my staff? How about you with another? That's what, can you tell? If thy name be called Luce, Luce, thou hast answered him well. Do you hear, you minion, you let us in, I hope? I thought to have asked you. And you said no. So come, help. Well struck, there was blow for blow. Thou baggage, let me in. Can you tell for whose sake? Master, knock the door hard. Let him knock till it ache. You'll cry for this minion if I'll beat the door down. What needs all that in a pair of stocks in the town? Is that at the door that keeps all this noise? By my troth, your town is troubled with unruly boys. Are you their wife? You might have come before. Your wife, sir knave, don't get you from the door. You hint in pain, master. This knave would go sore. Here is neither cheer, sir, nor welcome. We would fain have either. In debating which was best, we shall part with neither. We stand at the door, master. Bid them welcome hither. There is something in the wind that we cannot get in. You would say so, master, if your garments were thin. Your cake is there, warm within, and you stand here in the cold. It would make a man mad as a buck to be so bought and sold. Go fetch me something. I'll break up the gate. Break? Any breaking here, and I'll break your knave's pate. A man may break a word with you, sir, and words are but wind. I unbreak it in your face, so he break it not behind. <laughs> it seems thou wantest breaking out upon thee hind. There's too much out upon thee. I pray thee, let me in. I, when fowls have no feathers and fish have no fern. <laughs> well, I'll break in. Go borrow me a crow. Crow without a feather? Master, mean you so? For a fish without a fin, there's a fowl without a feather. If a crow help us in, Sarah, we'll pluck the crow together. Go get thee gone. Fetch me an iron crow. Have patience, sir. Oh, let it not be so. Herein you war against your reputation. Draw within the compass of suspect the unviolated honor of your life. Once this, 
your long experience of her wisdom, her sober virtue, years, and modesty, please, not on her part, some cause to you unknown. I doubt not, sir, but she will well excuse why at this time the doors are made against you. Be ruled by me. Depart in patience and let us to the tiger all to dinner. And about evening, come yourself alone to know the reason of this strange restraint. <laughs> if by strong hand you offer to break in now, the stirring passage of the day, a vulgar comment will be made of it. And that supposed by the common route against your yet ungalled estimation that may, with foul intrusion, enter in and dwell upon your grave when you are dead. For slander lives upon succession forever housed where it gets possession. You have prevailed. I will depart in quiet. And despite of mirth mean to be merry, I know a wench of excellent discourse, pretty and witty and wild, and yet too gentle. There we will dine. This woman that I mean, my wife, but I protest without Desert hath oftentimes embraided with all. To her we will go to dinner. Get you home. I'll fetch the chain. By this I know tis made. Bring it, I pray you, to the porcupine. For then there's the house. That chain will I bestow. Be it for nothing but to spite my wife. Upon mine hostess there, good sir, make haste. Since mine own doors few entertain me, I'll knock elsewhere to see if they'll disdain me. I'll meet you at that place some hour hence. Do so. This just shall cost me some expense. Scene two. The same. Enter Luciana and Antiphilus of Syracuse. And may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office. Shall Antiphilus, even in the spring of love, thy love springs rot? Shall love in building grow so ruinous? If you did wed my sister for her wealth, then for her wealth's sake, use her with more kindness. Or if you like elsewhere, do it by stealth. Muffle your false love with some show of blindness. Let not my sister read it in your eye. Be not thy tongue thy own shame's orator. Look sweet, be fair, become disloyalty. Apparel vice like virtue's harbinger. Bear a fair presence, though your heart be tainted. Teach sin the carriage of a holy saint. Be secret false. What need she be acquainted? What simple thief brags of his own attaint? Tis double wrong to truant with your bed and let her read it in thy looks at board. Shame hath a bastard fame well managed. Ill deeds are doubled with an evil word. Alas. Poor women, make us but believe, being compact of credit, that you love us, though others have the arm. Show us the sleeve. We in your motion turn, and you may move us. Then, gentle brother, get you in again. Comfort my sister. Cheer her. Call her wife. Tis holy sport to be a, a little vain when the sweet breath of flattery conquers strife. You're on mute. Sweet mistress, what your name is else I know not, nor by what wonder you do hit of mine less in your knowledge and your grace you show not than our earth's wonder more than earth divine. Teach me, dear creature, how to think and speak. Lay open to my earthy gross conceit, smothered in errors, feeble, shallow, weak, to fold meaning of your words, deceit against my soul's pure truth. Why labor you to make it wander in an unknown field? Are you a god? Would you create me new? Transform me then, and to your wonder I'll yield. But if that I am I, 
then well I know your weeping sister is no wife of mine, nor to her bed no homage do I owe. Far more, far more to you do I decline, oh, train me not, sweet mermaid, with thy notes to drown me in thy sister's flood of tear. Sing, siren, for thyself, and I will dote. Spread o'er the silver waves thy golden hair, and as a bed I'll take them and there lie. And in that glorious supposition think he gains by death that hath such means to die. Let love, being light, be drowned if she sink. Are you mad that you do reason so? Not mad, but made it. How, I do not know. It is a fault that springeth from your eye. For gazing on your beams, fair sun being by. Gaze where you should, and that will clear your sight. As good to wink, sweet love, as look on night. Why call you me, love? Call my sister so. Thy sister's sister. That's my sister. No, it is thyself. Mine own self's better part. My eyes clear I, my dear heart's dearer. Heart, my food, my fortune, and my sweet hope's aim. My soul, earth's heaven, and my heaven's claim. All this my sister is, or else should be. Call thyself sister sweet, for I am thee. Thee will I love, and with thee lead my life. Thou hast no husband yet, nor I no wife. Give me thy hand. Oh, soft air, hold you still. I'll fetch my sister to get her good will. <laughs> Why, how now, Dromeo? Where once thou so fast? Do you know me, sir? Am I Dromeo? <laughs> Am I your man? Am I myself? Thou art Dromeo. Thou art my man. Thou art thyself. I am an ass. I am a woman's man and besides myself. What? Woman's man? And how besides thyself? Besides thyself? Mary, sir, besides myself. I am due to a woman, one that claims me, one that haunts me, one that will help me. What claims lay she to thee? Mary, sir, such claim as you would lay to your horse, and she would have me as a beast. Not that I, being a beast, she would have me, but that she, being a very beastly creature, lays claim to me. What is she? A very reverent body. I, such a one as a man may not speak of without he say Sir Reverence. I have but lean luck in the match, and yet she is a wondrous fat marriage. How dost thou mean a fat marriage? Mary, sir, she's the kitchen wench and all grease, and I know not what use to put her to, but to make a lamp of her and run from her by her own light. Mm. I warrant her rags and the tallow in them will burn a Poland winter. If she lives till doomsday, she'll burn a week longer than the whole world. <laughs> What's her name? Luce, sir. Does she bear some breath? No longer from head to foot than from hip to hip. She is spherical like a globe. I could find out countries in her. In, in what part of her body stands Ireland? Mary, sir, in her buttocks. I found it out by the bogs. Where Scotland? I found it by the barrenness, hard in the palm of the hand. <laughs> Where's France? In her forehead, armed and reverted, making war against her heir. <laughs> Where England? I looked for the chalky cliffs, but I could find no whiteness in them. But I guess it stood in her chin by the salt room that ran between France and it. <sighs> 
Where's Spain? Faith, I saw it not, but I felt it hot in her breath. Oh, where America, the Indies? Oh, sir, upon her nose, all or embellished with rubies, carbuncles, sapphires, declining their rich aspect to the hot breath of Spain, who <laughs> sent whole armadas of carrots to be ballast at her nose. Where stood Belgium, the Netherlands? Oh, sir, I did not look so low. <laughs> to conclude this drudge or diviner laid claim to me, called me Dromeo, swore I was assured to her, told me what pretty marks I had about me as the mark of my shoulder, the mole in my neck, the great wart on my left arm that I, amazed, ran from her as a witch. And I think if my breast had not been made of faith and my heart of steel, she had transformed me to a curdled dog and made me turn the wheel. Go hie thee presently, post to the road. And if the wind blow any way from shore, I will not harbor in this town tonight. If any bark put forth, come to the mark where I will walk till thou return to thee. If everyone knows us and we know none, tis time, I think, to trudge, pack, and be gone. As from a bear a man would run for life, so fly I from a her that would be my wife. <sighs> There's none but witches do inhabit here. And therefore tis high time I were hence. She that doth call me husband, even my soul doth for a wife abhor. But her fair sister possessed with such a gentle sovereign grace of such enchanting presence and discourse hath almost made me traitor to myself. But lest myself be guilty to self wrong, I stop mine ears against the mermaid song. Whew. Master Antipholus. Hi, that's my name. <laughs> I know it well, sir. Look, here mm -hmm. is the chain. I thought to obtain you at the Porpentine. Uh, the chain unfinished made me stay thus long. What is your will that I shall do with this? What? Please yourself, sir. I have made it for you. Made it for me, sir. I bespoke it not. Uh, not once, nor twice, but twenty times you have. Go home with it, and please your wife with all. And soon at supper time, I'll visit you, and then receive my money for the chain. But I pray you, sir, receive the money now, for I fear you never see the chain, nor money more. <laughs> you are a merry man, sir. Fare you well. But no, I, I just... What I should think of this, I cannot tell. But this, I think, there's no man is so vain that would refuse so fair and offered chain. I see a man here needs not live by shifts when in the streets he meets such golden gifts. I'll, I'll to the mart and there for Dromeo stay. If any ship put out, then straight away. Five minute intermission. Thank you, five. Thank you, five. Thank you, five. Thank you, five.
All right, are we all back and ready to go? Yep. You. Present. Yep. All righty, yes. let us continue. Act four, scene Hold on. I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm having a, I'm like, I can't see any of the gallery view or, or anything. I'm just seeing like, ha, ah, I don't it's know what you guys No one's screens are on, so when no one's <laughs> screens are on, it does the hat. Correct. Cool. Got it. Glad we got that sorted video out. Video on as we announced the scene in, so that's probably why no one had it on. No worries. All right. Act four, scene. Sorry, one. I thought it was looking at me. A public place. Enter a second merchant, Angelo, and an officer. You know, since Pentecost, the sum is due, and since I have not much importuned you, nor now I had not, but that I am bound to Persia, and want guilders for my voyage. Therefore, make present satisfaction, or I'll attach you by this officer. Even just the sum that I do owe to you is growing to me by Antipholus. And in the instant that I met with you, he had of me a chain. At five o'clock, I shall receive the money for the same, uh, please, if you walk with me down to his house, I will discharge my bond and thank you, too. Uh, 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 that, that labor you may save. Uh, see where he comes. Hmm. While I go to the goldsmith's house, go down by a rope's end. That I will bestow among my wife her confederates, for locking me on my doors by day. But soft, I see the goldsmith. Get, get thee gone. Buy thou a rope and bring it home to me. I buy it. Thousand pound a year, I buy a rope. I may as well hold up by that trust to you. I promise your presence and the chain, but neither chain nor goldsmith came to me. Be like you thought our love would last too long if it were chained together and therefore came not. <laughs> Saving your merry humor, here's the note how much your chain weighs to the utmost carat fineness of the gold and charge full fashion, uh, which doth amount to uh, three odd ducats more than I stand debted to this gentleman. I pray you see him presently discharged, for he is bound to see and stays but for it. I am not furnished with the present money. Besides, I have business in the town. Good senor, take the stranger to my house, and with you take the chain and bid my wife disperse the sum on the receipt thereof. Perchance I will be there as soon as you. Uh, then you will bring the chain to her yourself? No, bear with you, lest I come not time enough. <laughs> well, sir, I, I, I will. Uh, have you the chain about you? And if I have not, sir, I hope you have, or else you may return without your money. <laughs> Nay, come, I pray you, sir, give me the chain. Uh, both wind and tide stays for this gentleman, and uh, I, to blame, have held him here too long. Good Lord, you use this dalliance to excuse your breach of promise to the porpentine. I should have hired you for not bringing it. But, like a sure, you must begin to brawl. The hour steals on, I pray you. <laughs> you, you hear how he importunes me? Uh, the chain. Why, give it to my wife and fetch your money. Oh, come, come. You know I gave it to you even now. Either send the chain or send by me some token. Fine. Now you can run this humor out of breath. Where's the chain, I pray you? Let me see it. My business cannot brook this dalliance. Good sir, say whether you'll answer me or no. If not, I'll leave him to the officer. I answer you? What should I answer you? The money that you owe me for the chain. I you none till I receive the chain? You know I gave it to you half an hour hence. You gave me none. You wronged me much to say so. You wronged me more, sir, in denying it. Uh, consider how it stands upon my credit. Well, officer, arrest him at my suit. I do, and I charge you in the Duke's name to obey me. This touches me in reputation. Either consent to pay this sum for me, or I attach you by this officer. Right. Consent to pay thee that I never had? Arrest me, foolish fellow, if thou darest. Here is thy fee. Arrest him, officer. I would not spare my brother in this case if he should scorn me so apparently. I 
do arrest you, you sir. Uh, you hear the suit. I do a, I do obey thee till I give thee bail. But, sirrah, you must buy the sport as dear as all the metal you shop will answer. <laughs> sir, sir, I will have law in Ephesus to your notorious shame. I doubt it not. Master, there is a bark of epidemnum that says, but till her owner comes aboard, and then, sir, she bears away. Our frottage, sir, I have conveyed aboard, and I have brought the oil, the balsamum, and aquavita. The ship is in her trim. The merry wind blows fair from land. They stay not at all, but for their owner, master, and yourself. How now? A madman? Why, thou peevish sheep, what ship of Ebnon stays for me? A ship you sent me to, to hire waftage? Thou drunken knave, I sent thee for a rope, and told thee what to what purpose and what end. You sent me for a rope's end as soon. You sent me to the bay, sir, for a bark. I will debate this matter at more leisure and teach your ears to list me with more heed to Adriana, villain, hide thee straight. Give her this key desk that's covered over with the Turkish tapestry. There is a purse of ducats. Let her send it. Tell her I am arrested in the street, and that shall bail me. Heidi, now be gone. On officer to prison, tell it come. To Adriana, that is where we dined. Where Dazabelle did claim me for her husband, she is too big, I hope, for me to compass. Thither I must, although against my will, for servants must their master's minds fulfill. Scene two, the house of Antiphilus of Ephesus. Enter Adriana and Luciana. Oh, Luciana, did he tempt thee so? Must thou perceive austerely in his eye that he did plead in earnest, yea or no? Looked he all red or pale, or sad or merrily? What observation madest thou in this case of his heart's meteor, meteors tilting his face? First, he denied you had him in no right. He meant he did me none, the more my spot. Then swore he that he was a stranger here. And true he swore, though yet forsworn he were. Then pleaded I for you. And what said he? That love I begged for you, he begged of me. With what persuasion did he tip thy love? With words that in an honest suit might move. First he did praise my beauty, then my speech. Hmm. Didst speak him fair? Have patience, I beseech. I cannot, no, I will not hold me still. My tongue, though not my heart, shall have his will. He is deformed, crooked, old, and sere. Ill faced, worse body, shapeless everywhere. Ugh. Vicious and gentile, foolish, blunt, unkind, stigmatical in making, worse in mind. It who would be jealous then of such a one? No evil lost is wailed when it is gone. <laughs> but I thank him better than I say, and yet would hear in others' eyes were worse. Far from her nest, the lapwing cries away. My heart prays for him, though my tongue do curse. Here, go, the desk, the purse, Sweet, now make haste. How hast thou lost thy breath? I'm running fast. Where is thy master, Dromeo? Is he well? No. He's in Tartar limbo, worse than hell. A devil in the everlasting garment hath him. One whose hard heart is buttoned up with steel. A fiend, a fury, pitiless and rough. A wolf, nay, worse, a fellow all in buff, a back 
friend, a shoulder clapper, one that countermands the passages of alleys, creeks, and narrow lands, a hound that runs counter and yet draws dry foot well, one that before judgment carries poor souls to hell. What, man? what is the matter? I do not know the matter. He is rested on the case. What? Is he arrested? Tell me at whose suit. I know not at whose suit he is arrested well, but he's in a suit of buff which rested him, that I can tell. Will you send him Mistress Redemption, the money in his desk? Go fetch it, sister. This I wonder at, that he unknown to me should be in debt. Tell me, was he arrested on a band? Not on a band, but on a stronger thing, a chain, a, a chain. Do you not hear it ring? What? The chain? No, no, the bell. Tis time that I were gone. I was two, it was two ere I left him, and now the clock strikes one. The hours come back. That did I never hear. Oh, yes. If any hour meet a sergeant, it turns back for very fear. As if time were in debt. How fondly dost thou reason? Time is a very bankrupt and owes more than he's worth to season. Nay, he's a thief, too. Have you not heard men say that time comes stealing on by night and day? Hmm. If time be in debt and theft and a sergeant in the way, hath he not reason to turn back an hour in a day? Hmm. Go, Dromeo. There's the money. Bear it straight and bring thy master home immediately. Come, sister. I am pressed down with conceit. Conceit, my comfort, and my injury. Hmm. Scene three, a public place. Enter Antiphilus of Syracuse. There's not a man I meet but doth salute me, as if I were their well-acquainted friend, and everyone doth call me by my name. Some tender money to me, some invite me, some other give me thanks for kindness. Some offer me commodities to buy. Even now a tailor called me in his shop and showed me silks that he had bought for me and therewithal took measure of my body. Sure, these are but imaginary wiles and lot land sorcerers inhabit here. Master, here's the gold you sent me for. But have you got the picture of old Adam new apparelled? What gold is this? What Adam dost thou mean? Not that Adam that kept the paradise, but that Adam that keeps the prison. He that goes in the calf skin that was killed for the prodigal. He that came behind you, sir, like an evil angel, and bid you forsake your liberty. I understand thee not. No? Why, tis a plain case. He that went like a base file and a case of leather, the man, sir, that when gentlemen are tired, gives them a sob and rests them. He, sir, that takes pity on decayed men and gives them suits of durance. He that sets up his rest to do more exploits with his mace than a Morris Pike. What, thou meets an officer? Hey, sir, the sergeant of the band. He that brings any man to answer it that brings his band. One thinks that a man always going to bed and says, God give you good rest. Well, sir, there rest in your foolery. Is there any? Oh, I, sir, I brought you word an hour since that the bark expedition put forth tonight. And then were you hindered by the sergeant to carry for the hoy delay? Here are the angels that you sent for to deliver you. The fellow is distract, and so am I, and here we wander in illusion. So, blessed power, deliver us from hence. <laughs> well met, well Where? met, Master Antiphilus. I see, sir, you have found the goldsmith now. Is that the chain you promised me today? Satan, avoid. I charge thee, tempt me not. Master, is this mistress Satan? It is the devil. Nay, she is worse. She has a double dam, and here she comes in the habit of a light wench, and thereof comes that the wenches say, God damn me, that is much to say, God make me a light wench. 
It is written, they appear to men like angels of light. Light is an effect of fire, and fire will burn air for white benches burn. Come not near her! <laughs> Mary, sir, will you go with me? We'll mend our dinner here. Master, if you do, expect spoon meat or speak a long spoon. Why, Romeo? Mary, he must have a long spoon that must eat with the devil. Avoid then, fiend. What tells thou me of supping? Thou art, as you all are, as you are all, a sorceress. I conjure thee to leave me and be gone. Give me the ring of mine you had at dinner, or for my diamond, the chain you promised, and I'll be gone, sir, and not trouble you. Some devils ask but the parings of one's nail, a rush, a hair, a drop of blood, a pin, a knot, a cherry stone, but she, more covetous, would have a chain. Master, be wise, and if you give it her, the devil will shake her chain and fright us with it. I pray you, sir, my ring or else the chain. Uh, I hope you do not mean to cheat me so. Avant, thou witch. Come, Dromeo, let us go. My bride, says the peacock, mistress that you know. Now out of doubt, Antithelus is mad, else he would never so demean himself. A ring he had of mine worth forty ducats, and for the same he promised me a chain. Both one and the other he denies me now. The reason that I gather, he is mad. Besides this present instance of his rage is a mad tale he told me today at dinner, of his own doors being shut against his entrance. Like his wife, acquainted with his fits <laughs> on purpose shut the doors against his way. My way is now to hie home to his house and tell his wife that being lunatic, he rushed into my house and took perforce my ring away. This course I fit his choose, for forty ducats is too much to lose. Scene four, a street. Enter Antiphilus of Ephesus and the officer. Hear me not, man. I will not break away. I will give thee, ere I leave thee, so much money to warrant thee as I am rested for my wife is in a wayward mood today. I will not lightly trust the messenger. That I should be attached in Ephesus, I tell you, twill sound harshly in her ears. Uh, here comes my man. I think he brings the money. <laughs> How now, sir? Have you that I sent for you for? That I warrant you will pay them all. But where's the money? Why, sir, I, I gave the money for the rope. Five hundred ducats, villain, for a rope? I'll serve you, sir, five hundred at the rate. To what end did I bid thee hi home? To a rope's end, sir, and to that end I am returned. To that end, sir... I will welcome you. Oh. Uh, good, good, sir. Be patient. Oh, nay, it is for me to be patient. I am in adversity. Good. Now, uh, hold thy tongue. And nay, rather persuade him to hold his hands. Thou horse son, senseless villain. I would I were senseless, sir, that I might not feel your blows. Thou art sensible in nothing but blows, and so is an ass. Yeah, I am an ass indeed. You may prove it by my long ears. I have served him from the hour of my nativity to this instant, and have nothing at my hand at his hands for my service but blows. When I am cold, he heats me with beating. When I am warm, he cools me with beating. I am waked with it when I sleep. I am raised with it when I sit, driven out of doors with it when I go home, welcomed home with it when I return. Nay, I bear it on my shoulders as a beggar want her brat. And I think when he hath lamed me, I shall beg with it from door to door. Come, go along, my wife is coming yonder. Mistress? Respice finum, respect your end, or rather, the prophecy like the parrot, beware the rope's end. Wilt thou still talk? 
obey you now. Is not your husband mad? His incivility confirms no less. Good Dr. Pence, you are a conjurer. Establish him in his true sense again, and I will please you what you will demand. Last, how fiery and how sharp he looks. Mark, how he trembles in his ecstasy. Give me your hand and let me feel your pose. There is my hand. Let it feel your ear. Uh, I charge thee, Satan, housed within this man, to yield possession to thy holy prayers. And to thy state of darkness, hire thee straight. I conjure thee by all the saints in heaven. Peace, doting wizard. Peace. I am not mad. Oh, that thou wert not, poor distressed soul. You minion, you? Are these your customers? Did this companion with a saffron face revel and feast at my house today, while it's upon me the guilty doors were shut and I denied to enter in my house? Oh. Husband, God doth know you dined at home. Where would you have remained until this time, free from this landis and this open shame? Dined at home? Thou villain, what sayest thou? Sir, stoops to say you did not dine at home. Oh. Were not my doors locked and I shut out? Per thee, your doors were locked and you shut out. And did she not herself revile me there? Son's fable, she herself reviled you there. Did not her kitchen maid rail, taunt, and scorn me? Certainly she did. The kitchen vessel scorned you. And did not I rage depart from thence? In verity you did. My bones bear witness that sense hath felt the vigor of his rage. Is good to soothe him in these contraries. It is no shame. The fellow finds his vein. And yielding to him humors well his frenzy. Thou hast suffered the goldsmith to arrest me. Alas, I sent you money to redeem you. By Dromeo here, who came in haste for it. Money by me? Heart and goodwill you might, but surely master not a rag of money. Whence not thou to her for a purse of ducats? He came to me and I delivered it. And I am witness with her that she did. God and the rope maker bear me witness that I was sent for nothing but a rope. <laughs> Mistress, both man and master is possessed. I know it by their pale and deadly looks. They must be bound and laid in some dark room. <sighs> Say, wherefore, wherefore didst thou lock me for today, and why dost thou deny the bag of gold? I did not, gentle husband, lock thee forth. And gentle master, I received no gold, but I confess, sir, that we were locked out. <laughs> Dissembling villain, thou spakes false in both. Dissembling harlot, thou art false in all, and art confederate with a damned pack to make a loathsome abject scorn of me. But with these nails, I'll pluck out these false eyes and will behold me in the shameful sport. Enter three uh, or four who tried to bind him. He struck oh, him. Burn him! Burn him! Let him not come near me! More company, the fiend is strong with him! Hi me, poor man, how pale and wan he looks! What? Will you murder me? Thou jailer, thou, I am thy prisoner, will thou suffer them to make a rescue? Uh, uh, ma 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 masters, let him go. He's my prisoner, and you shall not have him. Go bind this man, for he is frantic too. They tried to bind Romeo of Ephesus. What wilt thou do, thou peevish officer? Hast thou delight to see a wretched man do outrage and displeasure to himself? Well, uh, it, it, he, he's my prisoner. Uh, if, if I let him go, the debt he owes will be required of me. I will discharge the air I go from thee. Bear me forth with unto his creditor, and I, knowing how the debt rose, I will pay it. Good master doctor, see him safe conveyed home to my house. <coughs> most unhappy day. <laughs> oh, most unhappy strumpet. Master, I am here entered in bond for you. 
out on thee, villain? Wherefore dost thou mad me? Will you be bound for nothing? Be mad, good master! Cry the devil! God help poor souls, how idly do they talk! Go, bear him hence. Sister, go you with me. Say now, whose suit is he arrested? Uh, one, uh, uh, Angelo, yeah, a, a goldsmith. Do you know him? I know the man. What is the sum he owes? Two hundred ducats. <gasps> Say, how grows it do? Uh, do for a chain your husband had of him. He did bespeak a chain for me. But had it not, when, as your husband, all in a rage today, came to my house and took away my ring, the ring I saw upon his finger now, straight after did I meet him with a chain. It may be so, but I did never see it. Come, jailer, bring me where the goldsmith is. I long to know the truth hereof at large. <laughs> God, through thy mercy, they're loose again! And come with naked souls. Let's come all help to have them bound again. <laughs> Let way don't kill us! I see these witches are afraid of swords. He that would be your wife now ran from you. Come to the centaur and fetch our stuff from thence. I long that we were safe and sound abroad. Faith, stay here this night. They will surely do us no harm. You saw they speak us fair. Give us gold. Methinks they are such a gentle nation that, but for the mountain of mad flesh that claims marriage of me, I could find it in my heart to stay here still and turn witch. <laughs> I will not stay tonight for all the town. Therefore, away to get our stuff abroad. Act five, scene one, a street before a priori. Enter second merchant and Angelo. I am sorry, sir, that I have hindered you, but I protest he had the chain of me, though most dishonestly he doth deny it. How is the man esteemed here in the city? A, a very reverend reputation, sir, a, of credit infinite, highly beloved, second to none that lives here in the city. His word might bear my wealth at any time. Hmm. Speak softly, Yonder, as I think he walks. Tis so. Oh, and that self-chain about his neck, which he forswore most monstrously to have. Good sir, draw near to me. I, I'll speak to him. Signor Antipholus, I wonder much that you would put me to this shame and trouble, and not without some scandal to yourself, with circumstance and oaths so to deny this chain, which now you wear so openly. Uh, beside the charge, the shame, imprisonment, you have done wrong to this, my honest friend, who, but for staying on our controversy, had hoisted sail and put to sea today. Uh, this chain you had of me, can you deny it? Well, uh, I think I had. I never did deny it. Yes, that you did, sir, and forswore it, too. Who heard me to deny it or forswear it? These ears of mine, thou knowest, did hear thee. Fie on thee, wretch, tis pity that thou livest, to walk where all any honest man resort. Thou art a villain to impeach me thus. I'll prove mine honor and mine honesty against thee presently, if thou darest stand. I dare, and do defy thee for a villain. They draw swords. Hold! Hurt him not, for God's sake! He is mad! Some, get within him! Take his sword away! Bind Dromeo too, and bear them to my house! Run, master, run! For God's sake, take a house! This is some priory, and or we are spoiled! Be 
quiet, people. Wherefore throng you hither? To fetch my poor, distracted husband hence. Let us come in, that we may bind him fast and bear him home for his recovery. I knew he was not in his perfect wits. Uh, I am sorry now that I did draw on him. How long hath this possession held the man? This week he hath been heavy, sour, sad, and much different from the man he was. But till this afternoon his passion never break in extremity of rage. Hath he not lost much wealth by wreck of sea? There is some dear friend. Hath not else his eyes strayed his affection and unlawful love? A sin prevailing much in youthful men who give their eyes the liberty of gazing? Which of these sorrows is he subject to? To none of these, except it be the last, namely some love that drew him off from home. You should for that have reprehended him. Why, well, so I did. Aye, but not rough enough. As roughly as my modesty would let me. Happily in private. And in assemblies too. Aye, but not enough. It was the copy of our conference. In bed he slept, not for my urging it. At board he fed, not for my urging it. Alone it was a subject of my theme. In company I often glanced it. Still did I tell him it was vile and bad. And therefore came it that the man was mad. The venom clamors of a jealous woman poisons more deadly than a mad dog's tooth. It seems he sleeps where hindered by thy railing, and therefore comes it that his head is light. Thou sayest his meat was sauce with thy upbraidings. On quiet meals make ill digestions, thereof the raging fire of fever bred, and what's a fever but a fit of madness? But thou sayest his sport was were hindered by thy brawls, sweet recreation barred, what doth ensue but moody and dull melancholy? I can't remember. Sure. grim and comfortless despair, and at her heels a huge infectious troop of pale distempertures and foes to life. In food, in sport, and life preserving rest, to be disturbed, who would mad or man or beast, the consequence is then thy jealous fits have scarce thy husband from the use of wits. She never reprehended him, but mildly, when he demeaned himself rough, rude, and wildly. Why bear you these rebukes and answer not? She did betray me to my own reproof. Good people enter and lay hold of him. No, not a creature enters in my house. Then let your servants bring my husband forth. Neither. He took this place for sanctuary, and it shall privilege him from your hands till I have brought him to his wits again, or lose my labor in assaying it. I will attend to my husband, be his nurse, diet his sickness, for it is my office, and will have no attorney but myself, and therefore let me have him home with me. Be patient, for I will not let him stir till I use the appropriate means I have, with wholesome syrups, drugs, and healthy prayers, to make of him a formal man again. It is a branch and a parcel of mine oath, a charitable duty of my order. Therefore depart and leave him here with me. I will not hence and leave my husband here, and it ill it doth beseem your holiness to separate the husband and the wife. Be quiet and depart, thou shalt not have him. Oh! Complain unto the duke of this indignity. Come, go, I will fall prostrate at his feet, and never rise until my tears and prayers have won his grace to come in person hither, and take perforce my husband from the Hmm. By this, I think the dial points at five. Anon, I am sure the Duke himself in person comes this way to the melancholy vale, the place of death and sorry execution, behind the ditches of the abbey here. Upon what cause? To see a reverend Syracusan merchant, who put unluckily into this bay, against the laws and statutes of his town, beheaded publicly for his offense. Uh, now see where they come. Uh, we will behold his death. Kneel to the duke before he pass the abbey. Enter Duke Salinas, attended, Aegean, bareheaded, and the headsman, and other officers. Yet once again proclaim it publicly. If any friend will pay the sum for him, he shall not die. So much we tender him. Justice, most sacred duke, against the abbess. 
she is a virtuous and a reverend lady. It cannot be that she hath done thee wrong. May it please your grace, Antipholus, my husband, whom I made lord of me and all I had, at your important letters, this ill day a most outrageous fit of madness took him, that desperately he hurried through the street, with him his bondmen, all as mad as he, doing displeasure to the citizens by rushing into their houses, bearing thence rings, jewels, anything his rage did like. Once did I get him bound and sent him home, whilst to take order for the wrongs I went, that here and there his fury had committed. Anon, I would not by what strong escape he broke from those that had the guard of him, and with his mad attendant and himself, each one with awful passion, with drawn swords, met us again and madly bent on us, chased us away till raising of more aid, we came again to find them. Then they fled into this abbey, whither we pursued them, and here the abbess shut the gates on us, and will not suffer us to fetch him out, nor send him forth that we may bear him hence. Therefore, most gracious duke, with thy command, let him be brought forth and born hence for help. Long since thy husband served me in thy wars, and I to thee engaged a prince's word, when thou didst make him master of thy bed, to do him all the grace and good I could. Go, some of you, knock at the abbey gate, and bid the lady abbess come to me. I will determine this before I stir. Oh, mistress, mistress, shift and save yourself. My master and his men are both broke loose, beatens the maids a row, and bound the doctor, whose beard they have singed off with brands of fire. And ever as it blazed, they threw on him <coughs> great pails of muddled mire to quench the hair. And my master preaches patience to him, and the while his man, and with his scissors, nicks him like a fool. And sure, unless you send some present help between them, they will kill the conjurer. Peace, fool. Thy master and his man are here, and that is false thou dost report to us. Mistress, upon my life, I tell you true. I have not breathed almost since I did see it. He cries for you and vows if he can take you to scorch your face and to disfigure you. Hard park, I hear mistress fly, be gone. Come, stand by me, fear nothing. Guard with halberds. Ah, uh, me, it is my husband, witness you, that he is born about invisible. Even now we house him in the abbey here, and now he's there, past thought of human reason. Justice, most gracious duke, oh, grant me justice, even for the service that long since I did thee, when I bestrid thee in the wars and looked took deep scars to save thy life, even for the blood that then I lost for thee. Now grant me justice. Unless the fear of death doth make me dote, I, I see my son Antiphilus and Andromeo. Justice, sweet prince, against that woman there, she whom thou gavest to me to be my wife that hath abused and dishonored me, even in the strength and height of injury. Beyond imagination is the wrong that she this day hath shameless thrown on me. Uh, discover how, and thou shalt find me just. This day, great duke, she shut the doors upon me, while she with harlots feasted in my house. A grievous fault! Say, woman, didst thou so? No, my good lord, myself. He and my sister today did dine together, so before my soul, and this is false, he burdens me with all. Ne'er may I look on day nor sleep on night, but she tells to your highness simple truth. Mm -hmm. Oh, perjured woman, they are both forsworn. In this the madman justly charges them. My liege, I am advised what I say. Neither disturbed with the effect of wine, nor heady rash, provoked from raging ire. Albeit my wrongs may have one wiser mad. This woman locked me out of this day from dinner. That goldsmith 
there, were he not packed with her, could witness it. For he was with me then, who parted with me to go fetch a chain, promising to bring it to port time, where Balthazar and I did dine together. Our dinner done, and he not coming thither, I went to seek him in the street I met him, and in his company, that gentleman that there did this perjured goldsmith wear me down, that I this day him received the chain, which God he knows I saw not, for the which he did arrest me with an officer. And I did obey, and sent my peasant home for certain ducats. He with none returned, then fairly I bespoke the officer to go in with person with me to my house. By the way we wet, my wife, her sister, and a rabble more of vile confederates along with them. They brought one pinch, a hungry lean-faced villain, a mere anatomy, a mountain back, a threadbanger, bear juggler, and fortune teller, a needy hollow-eyed, sharp-looking wench, a dead-looking man, this pernicious knave, forsooth took on him as a conjurer, and gazing in mine eyes, feeling my pulse, and with no face as were out facing me, cries of I was possessed. Then altogether they fell upon me, bound me, bore me thence, and in a dark and dankish vault at home, there left me and my man, both bound together, till gnawing my teeth of bones and sunder, I gained my freedom, and Im immediately ran hither to your grace, whom I beseech to give me ample satisfaction for these deep shames and great indignities. Uh, my lord, in truth, thus far I witness with him that he dined not at home, but was locked out. But had he such a chain of thee, or no? He had, my lord, and when he ran in here, these people saw the chain about his neck. Sorry, guys. Besides, I will be sworn these ears of mine heard you confess that you had the chain of him after you first forswore it on the mart, and thereupon I drew my sword on you. And then you fled into this abbey here, from whence I think you are come by miracle. I never came within these abbey walls, nor ever didst thou draw thy sword on me. I never saw the chain, so help me heaven! And this... False, you burden me with all. Why, what an intricate impeach is this? I think you all have drunk of Circe's cup. If here you housed him, here he would have been. If he were mad, he would not plead so coldly. You say he dined at home. The goldsmith here denies that saying. Sarah, what say you? Sir, he dined with her there at the Porpentine. He did, and from my finger snatched that ring. Tis true, my liege, this ring I had of her. Sawst thou him enter at the abbey here? As sure, my liege, as I do see your grace. Oh, why, this is strange. Go call the abbess hither. I think you are all mated or stark mad. Most mighty duke, but, but safe be speak a word. Happily, I see a friend will save my life and pay the sum that, that, that may deliver me. Speak freely, Syracusian, what thou wilt. Is not your name, sir, called Antiphilus? And is not that your, your bondman, Dromeo? Within this hour I was his bondman, sir, but he, I thank him, nod into my cords. Now I am Dromeo and his man unbound. I, I am sure you both of you remember me ourselves we do remember sir by you for lately we were bound as you now are you are not pinches patient are you sir why look you strange on me you know me well i never saw you in my life till now oh grief hath changed me since you saw me last in careful hours of times to form hand have, have written strange to features on my face but tell me yet Dost thou not know my voice? Neither. But Dromeo, nor thou? No, trust me, sir, nor I. I am sure thou dost. I, sir, but I am sure that I do not. And whatsoever a man denies, you are bound to believe him. Not know my voice. Oh, time's extremity. Hast thou so cracked and splitted my poor tongue in seven short years that, that here... My only son knows not my feeble key of untoed cares. Though now this great face of mine be hid in sap consuming winter's drizzled snow, and, and all the conduits of my blood froze up, yet 
hath by night of life some memory, my wasting lamps, some, some fading glimmer left. My dull deaf ears a, a little used to hear uh, all these old witnesses. I cannot err. Tell me thou art my son Antiphilus. I never saw my father in my life. But seven years since, in Syracuse, boy, thou knowest we parted. But perhaps, my son, thou, thou shamest to acknowledge me in misery. The Duke and all that I know me in the city can witness with me that it is not so. I ne'er saw Syracusia in my life. I tell thee, Syracusian, twenty years have I been patron to Antiphilus, during which time he ne'er saw Syracusa. I see thy age and dangers make thee dote. Most mighty Duke, behold a man much wronged. See two husbands, or oh, mine eyes deceive me. One of these men is genius to the other, and so of these. Which is the natural man, and which the spirit? Who deciphers them? I, sir, am Dromeo, a man him away. I, sir, am Dromeo, let me say. Uh, Aegean, art thou not? Or, or else his ghost? Oh, my old master. Who hath bound him here? Whoever bound him, I will loose his bonds and gain a husband by his liberty. Speak, old Aegean. Thou beast the man that has a wife once called Amelia, that bore thee at burden two fair sons. O thou beast, same Aegean, speak, and speak unto the same Amelia. <laughs> if I treat not, thou art Amelia. And if thou art she, tell me, where is that sign that flooded with thee on the fatal raft? By men of Abedemnum, he and I and the twin Dromeo all were taken up. But by and by rude fishermen of Corinth, by force, took Dromeo and my son from them. And me they left with those of Abedemnum. When then became of them, I cannot tell. I to this fortune that you see me in. Why, here begins his morning story right. These two Antipholuses, these two so like, and these two Dromeos, one in semblance, Besides her urging of her wreck at the sea, these are the parents to these children, which accidentally are met together. Antiphilus, thou camest from Corinth first? Uh, no, sir, not I. I. I came from Syracuse. Stay, stay, stand apart. I know not which is which. I came from Corinth. My most gracious lord. Die with him. Brought to this town by a most famous warrior, Duke Menaphon, your most renowned uncle. Oh, which of you two did down with me today? Uh, uh, I, gentle mistress. And, uh, not you, my husband? No, I say nay to that. And so do I. <laughs> Yet did she call me so. And this gentle woman, her sister here, did call me brother. What I told you then, I hope I shall have leisure to make good, if this be not a dream I see and hear. That is the chain, sir, which you had of me. I think it be, sir, I deny it not. I, I thank you, sir. I deny it not. I sent you money, sir, to be your bail by Dromeo, but I think he brought it not. No, none by me. Oh, this purse of ducats I received from you, and Dromeo, my man, did bring them me. I see we still did meet each other's man, and I was taken for him, and he for me, and thereupon these errors are arose. These ducats pawn, I for my father here. Shall not need. Thy father hath his life. Sir. Have that diamond from you. 
There. Take it. And much thanks for my good cheer. Renowned Duke, vouchsafe to take the pains to go with us into the abbey here, and here at large discourse all our fortunes, and all that are assembled in this place that by the sympathized one day's error have suffered wrong. Go keep us company, and we shall make full satisfaction. Thirty-three years have I but gone in travail of you, my son, until this present hour my heavy burden ne'er delivered. The Duke, my husband, and my children both, and you the calendars of their nativity. Go to a gossip's feast and go with me. After so long grief, such festivity. With all my heart, I'll gossip at this feast. Master, shall I fetch your stuff from shipboard? Dromeo, what stuff of mine has thou embarked? Your goods that lay at host, sir, in the centaur. He, he speaks to me. I am your master, Dromeo. Come, <laughs> go with us. We'll look to that anon. Embrace thy brother there. Rejoice with him. There is a fat friend at your master's house that kitchened me for you today at dinner. She now shall be my sister, not my wife. <laughs> Thinks you are my glass, not my brother. I see about you. I am a sweet face, you. <laughs> Will you walk in and see their gossiping? Not I, sir. You are my elder. Well, it's a question. How should we try it? We'll draw cuts for the senior. Till then, lead thou first. Nay, then, thus. We came into the world like brother and brother, and now let's go hand in hand, not one before the other. Hey, Nick. 